All right. In this video, I want to talk about the so-called early church fathers and why they can't be trusted. Now, why I'm calling them the so-called early church fathers is because, in reality, the early church fathers are Jesus and the apostles. The ones who come after them are not the fathers. They would be the children, right? If we're going to use the context right. But you see, like, the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church like to actually bypass Jesus and the apostles, just put aside the Bible, and then set their foundation with the group that came after and call them the early church fathers as if you should be listening to them. And it's strange because they'll, they'll quote the early church fathers' writings, right? And they'll say, see, this proves the Catholic church, this proves the Orthodox church and what have you, right? And you should see the look on their face and the reaction if you say, well, you need an interpreter. That's your interpretation. And they'll be like, you don't need an interpretation. It says what it means. It means what it says. Oh, that's strange because when we go to the Bible, for some reason we can't go by what it says. It says what it means. It means what it says. We have to have an interpreter, and we can't interpret it ourselves. You, you see the contradicting right off the bat, right? I mean, Jesus, I mean, the Bible itself tells us from the very beginning that God said, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's no interpreting. You take God for what he said. Don't eat from that tree. It's not until you start to interpret things that you mess things up, right? The serpent comes and tries to reinterpret. Well, didn't God say you can eat from every tree? So he removes the part about not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then Eve foolishly adds to the word saying you can't even touch it right so it the whole problem that started from the very beginning is not taking god's word at face value they wanted to interpret to remove and add to it and that's exactly what the religious leaders do and the church traditions do they add and remove from the word of god and that's where you get into trouble but i'm going to just go through the scriptures to show you why we can't trust early church fathers. In 2 Peter chapter 2, and I figured I'll use Peter because Peter is supposed to be the first pope, right? And he says this at verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Right? Here we go over to Paul. In Galatians chapter 1 at verse 6, it says, I marvel that ye are soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Right? So this is something going on already while the apostles are walking on the earth, false teachers are coming in, changing the way of truth and turning it to something evil and perverting the grace of Christ into a, a different gospel, right? And Paul is saying, I'm, I'm surprised, like, how soon this is already happening? He's like, you, what's going on here, right? And we can see that uh, the issue here is that the gospel of grace is already being twisted, right? Because the gospel is that Jesus died for your sins and he rose again to justify you. So basically, Jesus took upon your punishment upon him and died. And he rose again from the dead, showing that he didn't have to pay for his own sins. Right? That he could die for you and walk away from it, which justifies you. And you believe what God did, you're saved. Because Jesus died for your past, your present, and your future sins. Right? When Jesus died, he didn't just, just die for the people who were alive at the time. He didn't just sacrifice himself for them. He died for all the people in the past, all their sins, their sins of their whole life, right? And 
for the sins of the people who were alive when he sacrificed himself, and for all of our sins and the sins we still commit 2,000 years later, right? And it, it's right there in front of you what Jesus did, past, present, future sins taken care of. Like think of the people in the past that already lived and died before Jesus died for them, but they had faith in the coming Messiah to save them. All of their sins for their whole life, they could live 120 plus years, and Jesus paid for all their sins, but you accepted Christ when you were, let's say, 8 or 16 or 24 years old or 40 years old, and you're living the rest of your life having to be perfect because Jesus only paid for your sins up until the time you accepted him. You see the imbalance there? I mean, it's just common sense. Jesus died that, that your whole life is considered dead, and he gives you his righteousness. And he has that righteousness to give you by raising from the dead, proving he didn't have to pay for his own sins. And here, Peter is talking about false teachers coming in, bringing in damnable heresies. Right? They're damnable. So they're rejecting what Jesus did. Like he says, they're damnable, even denying the Lord that bought them. Right? He bought us with his own blood. And a lot of these churches today want you to be jumping through all these flaming hoops to hopefully earn salvation eventually. But nobody ends up actually getting the carrot. They just have you spinning on this treadmill, on this hamster wheel, chasing this carrot that you're never going to get. Right? And then when people tell you about the grace of God, what Jesus has actually done, they give you the gospel. What do they do? They speak evil of it. Right? Uh, these people admit that they're sinners. And they think that they go to confession and say they're our fathers and their Hail Marys, go to Mass, take the Eucharist, and do these other rituals. And uh, then they might just go to purgatory and suffer for a little while and then go to heaven. And then when you tell them Jesus did all the work for you to go to heaven, you just got to accept that gift of grace by faith. They start speaking evil of you, saying you're given a license to sin. And you're like, I don't get it. You think that you can sin and just go to confess to a priest, say a Hail Mary and our Father, take the Eucharist, and then go to purgatory and go to heaven. So sinning to you doesn't matter because you can just do those things and you're fine. But then you condemn somebody who says, no, God himself cleanses me of my sin with his blood. And gives me his life. And you speak evil of it as if they're telling you you have a license to go sin. And that's exactly what has happened here. The, the gospel has been perverted. They turn grace, the grace of Christ, into something else. Right? You, you hear these people mix grace and works together, right? Grace and works are the opposite. I like to use this analogy if you asking somebody for directions and you're like, do I go left down this road or right? And they tell you left, right. You'd be like, what? I go left and right? And they're like, no, you go right, left. And you're like, huh? So I go right, then left? And they're like, no, left, right. And you're like, you're confusing me. I go both left, right? And you're like, no, you go right, left. And you're like, so I don't go either? And they're like, no, you go left, right. And you're like, well, it doesn't make sense. You're confusing me. And that's what you're doing when you say grace and works. It's a mix. Grace and works. They're complete opposites. You can't have them together. Even Paul tells us in Romans chapter 11 that if it's grace, then it's not works. Because grace is the opposite of works. And if it's works, it's no longer grace. Because works are the opposite of grace. Because grace is undeserved, unmerited, unearnable. It, you're given it because... God wants to. God loves you. And he's like, here, have this gift because I love you. You don't deserve it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Works is, oh, you did this, so I owe you this in return. You've earned it. They're complete opposites. You can't have both. It's one or the other. And you can see how these churches have changed this and they perverted the grace of God into another gospel. And this has already happened while the apostles were already walking on the earth, right? 
And Paul warns here in Acts chapter 20, at verse 29, he says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And this is just what Jesus said, right? Beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. So they're going to pretend as if they're Christian, right? Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant. But they're just wolves devouring the sheep. They're living off of the church because they only care about this world, this life. They get you put on the treadmill, on that hamster wheel, chasing that carrot of salvation that if you just step off the treadmill, Jesus will just give it to you and you can take it from him. You have salvation. But the churches get you running on that treadmill, chasing it, hoping you'll eventually get it one day, but you never will. You don't take the time to look at everybody else on the treadmill and realize that nobody has ever got the carrot. Nobody. And if you just turn around, you can see Jesus is like, hey, I got it right here. It's yours if you want it. I got it for you. Right? And we come over here. Here's an interesting one, what John has to say in Third John chapter 1. I think this is the only chapter. But uh, anyway, he says at verse 9, I wrote unto the church by Diotrephus, who loveth to have preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, practicing against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. So here we have some guy taking over a church, not allowing the apostles in. He won't receive them, won't receive their letters, and kicks the, the people who agree with the apostles out of the church. So church is already being taken over by non-Christians, right? Here's one of those wolves. And then the Catholics will say, well, how come at this time, uh, this church, I can't remember what church, Corinth, Corinth or something, uh, they had an issue and John was at Patmos. They could have wrote to John, but instead they wrote to the Bishop of Rome. This proves the Bishop of Rome's authority. No, it shows that they were an apostasy. Why wouldn't they go to John, who's an apostle, who talked directly to Jesus? Why would they go to somebody else who's a supposed successor of a different apostle? Why wouldn't they go right to John? It shows right there that they've already fallen away. Right? Matter of fact, John has something to say about the churches in Revelation. Chapter 2 and chapter 3, he talks about seven churches that are in Asia. Uh, one of them is Corinth, right? Uh, so he has something to say about all of them, how they fallen away, putting up with the deeds and doctrines of the Nicolaitans, going after the doctrines of Balaam, putting up with Jezebel, uh, all kinds of problems with the church. Yet you want to go to the early church and follow what they have to say. It just doesn't make any sense, right? Over here, another warning, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 15, it says, uh, Keep in mind that all the churches that are forming are forming in Asia, uh, what we call modern-day Turkey. So, like in Antioch and all the other churches mentioned, like Ephesus, Corinth, and what is it, uh, Thessalonia, and what have you, all these different places are in modern-day Turkey, but it was called Asia. It says here at verse 15, Know uh, this thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. So we've already seen here that the churches are already going astray. And Paul's not even gone yet. He's not even dead. Right? John's not dead and they're not paying attention to him anymore either. Right? So what do we do? When we get teachings from these so-called early church fathers and they have writings, what do we do? How do we know if they're really true, right? Well, Paul is an apostle. He was healing people. He even raised people from the dead. But guess what? Paul actually admonishes these people for not just taking him at his word. He says, about these Berians, these people from Berea, he says, 
These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So they didn't just take Paul at his word. When Paul, a miracle working apostle, was telling them things, they were like, yeah, okay. Well, what do the scriptures say? And they were like, hey, his teachings actually line up with the scriptures. So we know this guy's of God. He is an apostle. Right? And Paul doesn't get insulted and offended that they actually went to the word of God to test him. He was fine with that. But you see today with the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, and most of the Protestant churches, you want to test them to the scriptures and compare them to the scriptures, they're going to get offended. They're going to get offended and they're going to say, well, you need the, the early church fathers to interpret. You, you, need, uh, you need the church to interpret. Uh, you're seeing things wrong, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Uh, and the only people who are really actually against sola scriptura are the people who have beliefs that don't line up with the Bible. That's simply that. We got the word of God here. It's the standard. It's the foundation. If your beliefs are against the Bible, it's against the word of God, which means they're against God. Right? It's as simple as that. I mean, it's easy to understand. The children can grasp that. But people are stubborn and they've set up their own beliefs and they have their own agendas and that's what they go with. And they don't like that God rebukes them. So they try to put away the word of God and they like to rely on other things. And they say, oh, well, you need these things with the Bible. You need the early church fathers. You need the church. You need the, you know, the clergy to, uh, to help and to teach and to guide us. And it's like that's because your beliefs don't line up with the word of God. I've actually heard a Muslim debate with the Muslims say, I'm fine with the using the Quran and the Bible, but if I had to choose, I would choose the Quran. And I was like, that's exactly the Catholic mindset. I would use the traditions and the clergy, the magisterium, with the Bible, but if you're going to make me choose, I'm going to throw the Bible in the trash, and I'm going to go with the the leadership of the church and the traditions. And it was like, that's exactly a Muslim mindset. Yeah, I'll use both the Quran and the Bible, but when it comes down to it, I'm throwing the Bible in the trash for the Quran. And it was like, that's why they're joining together these days. They got a joint church for Chrislam now, where Catholicism and Muslims mix together. And it makes sense because their ideologies are the same. They're both against the Bible. They're both against the word of God. They're both against Jesus, as one is against God even having a son and dying for your sins, and the other claims that Jesus has, uh, that God has a son, Jesus, but they deny his saving grace. They talk with their forked tongue with grace and works, this contradictory term put together uh, that doesn't actually come together. But uh, yeah, that is that. I just wanted to briefly go over that. To get you to rely on a solid foundation, the true rock. Jesus is our rock. We need to be built upon him. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. I have got into videos where I get into that a little deeper, so I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, so test everybody. Obviously me. Everybody. Don't just trust some church. Don't just trust your favorite priest or pastor and what they're saying, test them for yourself because one day you're going to have to answer to God. You have to answer to God for yourself and everything you believe and everything you've said and everything you've done, right? And if you tell them, well, your church told me this, their traditions told me that, the Quran told me this, right? God's going to tell you, well, why did you think that was my church? Why did you think that was my priesthood? Why did you think those were my traditions? Why did you think I was backing the Quran? Why did you think that? Right? You're going to have to back that up to God himself. So you better get right with God and know what God actually said to make sure your beliefs line up with God. Because God's going to judge you, not the church, not the traditions, not the Quran or anything else.
So think about that. Thanks for watching. Take care.